the readings from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then 19 through 28. It's on page 91 of the New Testament of the Blue Bible, if you wish to read along. Listen again to the Word of God. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. End of verse 19. <clears throat> this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Remember when the Rangers won the World Series? <laughs> Golly, will I ever let anyone forget? <laughs> and then remember when they beat the Astros in game seven? Oh. I distinctly remember Corey Seeger's post game interview with Ken Rosenthal. Ken asked the then one time World Series MVP. You've seen some great things in the postseason. You've done some great things in the postseason. What did you think of Adolis Garcia in this series? And Seeger answered, he's a bad man, isn't he? <laughs> he said, to be able to come into this atmosphere, get booed at every bat, and do what he did was pretty special. It was really fun to watch. Now, something that struck me during that ALCS series is that when Garcia was going off, winning ALCS MVP, Seeger, not much so because he was just saving up his magic for the World Series, Seeger was one of the biggest cheerleaders of Garcia's heroics. And now this will sound like nothing compared to Shohei Otani, but Seeger earned approximately in 2023 $35 million. One site broke that down to $66.50 every minute throughout the year, or nearly $96,000 a day. Not bad. Seager came from the Dodgers with the World Series ring and that World Series MVP. All the accolades and pressure that come with that Nonetheless, people that followed him out there that I know assured me, hey, y'all are getting, and this is their words, a good dude. But still, with that much success and honestly that much money can come a bit of ego. Now, compare that to Garcia, whose base salary was just under $750,000. Now, in the real world that you and I live in, Okay, that's unfathomable. But in their world, 
Seeger made almost 47 times what Garcia did. And yet Seeger did not hesitate to not just share the spotlight, but shift it totally to someone who truly deserved it. And not everyone can do that. Not everyone has that kind of character. And we also saw that with the sudden arrival and ascendancy of Evan Carter. Now that tricked up left field at Minute Maid Park is tough to play. But if you remember Evan's Air Carter moment, robbing dirty Alex Bregman of that massive hit that also got dirty Jose Altuve out on a double play. Man, that was so good. Afterwards, we learned how both veterans, Travis Jankowski and Robbie Grossman especially, had trained up Evan how to play that gap. Robbie had played there uh, as an Astro. He saw the light, became a Ranger, <laughs> and said, you know, and took all of his experience and gave it to the rookie. I mean, those were veterans. They'd been replaced by this super young guy. And they showed no resentment in playing second fiddle. Second fiddle is a phrase we hear often. We might take for granted that everyone understands it, but you know, in an, in an orchestra, meritocracy still reigns, right? The best of each instrument is given the first chair position and the second best player plays, you guessed it, second chair. Now, substituting fiddle for violin, right? It refers to sitting and playing behind someone else, someone publicly recognized for being better than you. Now, most second fiddles dream of becoming first chair, right? And that can be a natural and healthy ambition. Right? It seems like most vice presidents dream of becoming president. And the college football transfer portal is a great example of this. I heard of a cartoon last week, and it showed this quarterback looking into the magical portal, and he's saying... I'm the third string quarterback at my school. He walks to the portal and he finds himself in this long winding line and he says, now I'm the 1,308th third string quarterback. Right? Now, there are some special people that can handle that role. I mean, I think of Jason Garrett. He was a great backup quarterback. Cooper Rush started five games last year, and when people were ready to anoint him and, and throw Dak away, he stepped back into Dak's potential league MVP shadow. But even harder is moving from first chair to second fiddle. We don't see that very often. People can't swallow their pride enough to do that. But John the Baptist showed how this can be done. After all, he was the one everyone was coming to hear. He drew the crowds that most churches today would covet. He was the best and most effective preacher, and he did it with spiritual integrity, definitely not just telling people what they wanted to hear. And then one day, finally, along came Jesus. And John the Baptist had a choice to make. Stay true to his calling, his purpose, his vocation, his voice, or short-term cash in on his popularity. But John the Baptist understood his identity and that guided him into the correct decision. However, it was clear that many others did not understand John's identity. Now, the entire Gospel of John has been compared to a courtroom trial. One reason is that the word testify and its variations occur 45 times throughout. And also the word and the concept of witness is all throughout it. And you can see the culmination of this when Pilate asks Jesus, right, what is truth? 
That's been the crucial question from the beginning. John the Baptist was on the stand and facing a volley of questions all revolving around his identity. Now you know like in a, when a lawyer asks the witness to identify the guilty party and the, and the drama builds until a finger is pointed. I'm trying to find someone who's not here today. Usually at the defendant, right? Now, what if the witness answered instead by pointing and saying to everyone else in the room, one by one, oh, it's not him. Okay, well, let's let the record show it's not him. Who is the guilty party? Well, it's not her. Okay, let the record show it's not her. Who is the guilty party? Well, it's not him, right? I mean, that would frustrate everyone. And these Levites and guys, they were getting frustrated because John answers kind of in that fashion. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. He was the voice, right? Finally, an actual positive answer, but still enigmatic. Not wrecking any, recognizing any authority from John, because they surely had not bestowed any authority upon him. They asked him, why are you baptizing then? I mean, after all, that wasn't uncommon then. Gentiles entering the Jewish faith had to be baptized and washed clean. What they didn't understand is why he was baptizing Israelites. Why must God's chosen people be washed clean like the Gentiles? Further answering their question while not directly answering it, John makes this interesting statement, right? He says, I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And Barclay notes a rabbinic saying that said, a disciple might do for his master anything a servant did, except to untie his sandals. Even that was stooping too low for a disciple. Yet that was the metaphor that John used to explain his position. That is not even second fiddle. That is way, way down the pecking order. All right, and we live in a culture where it can be popular to say, you know, it's not about me. But even that is used sometimes to boast how magnanimous someone is. It's like humble bragging, right? And we might not boast like Terrell Owens. If you remember, I mean, I, I will never forget. I love me some me! But that's the temptation that we all can face. I mean, it's alive and well even in churches, right? Who has the tallest steeple, literally or figuratively? Who has the most elaborate and expensive Christmas program? Now, full disclosure, my family was invited to one of the mega church productions that you might have heard of or seen some articles about. This was last Saturday. It was the day before ours. And, you know, while it was impressive in its own mega way, I was sitting there wondering what our presentation would look like in comparison. And I was looking forward to what I knew would be the simplicity and the innocence that I knew would be part of the experience. You know, I mean, we didn't hire any outside professionals to come in. I mean, thankfully, we, we do have an in-house wise man, Bob Watkins, and I loved seeing him participate. Seriously, I thought that was such a great witness to our kids and our youth and honestly all of us. So much so that when it does come to church awards season, I expect us to sweep the category of non-mega church Christmas pageant with a budget under a million dollars. I think <laughs> I think we're going to dominate, y'all. But I do want to be fair. 
that megachurch did present the gospel. They did get around to telling the Christmas story. The room was packed. So, honestly, I do truly hope that some lives were touched amidst seriously, the, the zip lines and pyrotechnics and the live camels. I honestly try not to be a church basher, because God knows there are enough of those already. So I don't want you walking out of here thinking I'm doing that. It's just, it's something. But let's bring it back to here. Let's look at how John the Baptist shows us what the church's call to evangelism is to look like, mega church or not. And first and foremost, we are to give testimony to the light. Now, the first way John shows us how to do that is by setting the record straight, something that's also very important in a courtroom setting, right? John's answers to who are you, to those questions, he clearly communicated that he was the witness of someone else who is much greater than us. One commentator wrote, the church and Christians are not the light of God in a dark world. I'll repeat that. The church and Christians are not the light of God in a dark world, but are those who give testimony to and are witnesses of the light. Our language and behavior are always to be pointers to someone who is greater than we are, thereby drawing others to Christ and not to ourselves. So the, the, the second way John shows us how to give a testimony is to give an authentic response. We must know and be comfortable with our identity. Right? We are children of God. We are ambassadors for Christ. Every now and then I like to share this exchange from the movie Rudy where Rudy is, is seeking counsel from a priest and the priest says, son, in 35 years of religious studies, I've come up with two, only two hard incontrovertible facts. There is a God and I am not him. To play second fiddle, you have to know yourself and to lose yourself, to give yourself away. Right? Even Socrates said that the key to wisdom, wisdom is to know thyself. And so in a culture that rewards the braggers, those who hog the spotlight, those that tear down competitors in a ruthless pursuit of the top spot, providing an authentic response is one of the boldest things Christians can do today. And lastly, John shows us what demonstrating humility looks like, right? We already touched on the metaphor of, unt of untying the thong of Jesus' sandal. Kenneth Carter Jr. said this, humility is a misunderstood concept, and it may be helpful to say what it is and what it is not. It is not low self-esteem. We are created in the image of God, and that is is good. Humility is not false modesty. We have been endowed with gifts and they are, be, they are to be used for the glory of God and the common good. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves. Humility is thinking of ourselves less. Now, people when they learn I'm a pastor, they might expect that from me. If someone knows, if you're an elder or a deacon, they might kind of expect that. But when everyday Christians live this kind of lifestyle, give this kind of witness and testimony, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, they will notice. And hopefully, you have that relational capital that one time they will ask you, what makes you do what you do? Why are you like that? And your answer isn't so much about who you are, rather, rather it's about whose 
you are, who your life and your witness and your voice is pointing to. One more story I want to share quickly. It's about a couple who took their son and daughter to Carlsbad Caverns. Anyone been there before? Okay, awesome. I haven't been there. But I don't know if you did the tour, but the story goes that the tour included this dramatic moment when it reached the deepest point underground. And upon reaching that point, the guide turned off the lights to show just how dark it is. And down there in the dark, the little boy started to cry. And immediately his sister quietly said to him, Don't worry. Someone here knows how to turn on the lights. (laughs) See, Advent is the promise and hope that there is someone who knows how to turn on the lights. John's Gospel, in fact, tells us The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Not only can someone turn on the lights, someone already has in sending Jesus. Too often, the church's witness sounds more like the little boy rather than the comforting sister. Be the living testimony of to the light that this world of darkness needs. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.